Hi everybody, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. In video G, we're going to focus on the brain stem. So, so far we've discussed the cerebrum in quite a bit of detail, as well as the diencephalon. Both of these big parts of the brain arise from one of your three primary brain vesicles, and that is the forebrain, or we can call it the prosencephalon. You may want to go back to the very first video where I discuss new relation, basically development of the nervous system, particularly with an emphasis on the development of the brain. And you'll see that we, I introduced you there to the primary brain vesicles and the secondary brain vesicles. There are three primary brain vesicles. In plain old English, we call them the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Or in more scientific terms, we call them the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. So here we're finally starting our discussion on the brainstem, and it arises from the midbrain and the hindbrain. Those are your two other primary brain vesicles. And like each one of the other major compartments of the major parts of the brain, we see that the brainstem is made up of three subparts. And the three subparts are as follows. We have the midbrain here in the bluish. We have the pons, which is this bulging part here, with the bulge always pointing anteriorly. And then we have the purplish, I'll have to use yellow, I don't have a purplish color here. Um, we have the purplish medulla oblongata, which is going to continue into the spinal cord. Because the brain stem is literally the stem that holds up the rest of the brain, all information that enters the brain and leaves the brain to via the spinal cord will have to go through that brain stem. And so it provides a pathway not only between higher brain centers, such as in the cerebral cortex, and lower brain centers, maybe within the brain stem themselves, but also between the rest of the brain and the spinal cord. Finally, the brain stem is where we see most of our cranial nerves arising. We have in the brain a total of 12 pairs of cranial nerves. You may have heard already of the optic nerve. We may have heard of the olfactory nerve. And those are not associated with the brainstem. But all other 10 pairs are associated with the brainstem. So the other two is or are going to be your olfactory nerves, which are olfactory nerves, Roman numeral one. That's how we also refer to them as via a capital Roman, Roman numeral. And your second cranial nerves are the optic nerves. And the remaining 10 are going to be arising from the brainstem. It's very important for all of you to realize that without a brainstem, we cannot survive because despite the fact that we discussed the hypothalamus being our visceral control center, it's just the big boss. The peons who carry out those commands from the hypothalamus are literally located in the brainstem. And particularly your pons and your medulla oblongata are going to be the ones who actually do the work that the hypothalamus assigns. So the brain stem is responsible for controlling all kinds of automatic behaviors that we need for survival. Now, you know, a lot of research, of course, has been done on animals in order for us to understand all these different functions of different brain regions. And so when the brain stem in animal brains was left intact, but a good portion of the rest of the brain was removed, 
they, these animals could still do a lot of these automatic behaviors, such as walking and running and climbing up a tree and chewing and swallowing, even copulating, grooming each other or oneself. Um, all of those things they could still do pretty well with the assumption that they were stimulated to do so. What I mean by that is that they could, could not consciously and voluntarily choose to do these behaviors. We call them automatic behaviors because they can occur without us being uh, voluntarily involved. So our brain stem functions at an, a non-conscious level or better an unconscious level. Let's now go through each part of the brain stem. Remember your three subparts are the midbrain, the pons, and then the medulla oblongata. In order to locate the midbrain, go back to finding the thalamus. Remember here's that little dot, your intermediate mass. Draw an ellipse shape around it, an egg shape around it, and you have the shape of the thalamus. So just inferior to that, all of this here is going to be the midbrain. Let me um, indicate it in blue. So all of this is more or less the midbrain. On the anterior side, we'll see the cerebral peduncles. And on the posterior side, we see two sets of bumps. There are, there's one set of bumps. There will be two sets of bumps. Notice that in the very center of that midbrain, I'm going to use green so it stands out more. We have a duct and that duct interconnects our third ventricle that runs through the middle of the thalamus with the fourth ventricle, this triangular space here that separates the cerebellum from the pons. And that duct we call the cerebral aqueduct and that is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So the fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid flows from ventricles, from ventricle to ventricle and eventually to the fourth ventricle via this cerebral aqueduct, which very much is part of the midbrain. Now, the midbrain arises directly from the, and I'm not sure if I have listed that here. No, nope, I didn't. From the, the, um, from this, the primary brain vesicle that we called the midbrain. So it arises from the primary brain vesicle called the midbrain, or what is its scientific name? Well, that is the mesencephalon. I'll abbreviate it. Again, go back to the first video or go back to the slides that cover neurulation. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look on the next slide at the anterior portion of the midbrain where we find the cerebral peduncles. And on the posterior side, we find two sets of bumps, two pairs of pump, bumps, so that means four bumps, right? And that's why you see quadri for four in here. By the way, the midbrain is connected to the cerebellum via the structures full of fibers called the superior cerebellar peduncles. Now notice that we have cerebral peduncles to discuss and there are cerebellar peduncles. Be careful on exams when you read too fast make sure that you can distinguish between the term cerebral and cerebellar. Big big difference there. So here we're looking at the anterior side of the brain stem. This is the bulging part of the pons facing you right now. So this is the anterior side. 
And our brain stem, again, in the blue, is going to be approximately right here, more or less. And so we see in there all of these lines, and those are the stripes created by those pyramids. Remember the pyramidal tracts that we learned about when we learned about the white matter of the brain, of the cerebrum. And the way they form or are formed almost looks like two hands or two feet, one here and one there, are holding up the rest of the brain. This being the rest of the brain, notice it says caudate nucleus here with the internal capsule. So they haven't drawn everything. Here's the lenticular nucleus. So this is the, these are the basal nuclei drawn here and then surrounding all of that, of course, we would have the rest of the cerebrum on either side. And so these pyramid, I'm sorry, these pyramids that collectively form the cerebral peduncles are like little feet that hold up the rest of the brain. Peduncle, meaning feet. And they contain the pyramids that descend from the primary motor cortex into the spinal cord. Remember that these pyramids are eventually going to cross over to the other side and that's what we refer to as decussation. And that occurs at the level of the medulla oblongata. So decussation of the pyramids occurs in the medulla oblongata. So imagine now that you can turn the brain stem around and you now look at it on the back side. So this time we're seeing our four little bumps right about here. And we refer to them collectively as the corpora, which means bodies. Singular, it would be corpus. And quadri means four. Gemini means twins. So the bodies of four twins. Now we can divide them up into two sets. So we have superiorly the superior colliculi, so SC for superior colliculi, and then we have here the inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi are going to function in visual reflexes, so in other words, these superior colli colliculi combine all kinds of sensory information, not just visual, but even auditory and possibly uh, things that are touching your skin, things that are happening to your skeletal muscles to then uh, develop a reflex and that is a visual reflex. The inferior colliculi on the other hand are going to function as more as auditory relay centers. So they might be involved in auditory reflexes but they're really, they function primarily in uh, allowing the sound action potentials to um, move from one neuron to another neuron or from one part of the brain to the next part of the brain to ultimately reach the cerebral cortex. Okay, so we just looked at structures in the midbrain that are very visible on the exterior of the brain, right? So if we were to remove the brain from a human cadaver, we could very easily point to where the cerebral peduncles were on the anterior side of the midbrain, then turn the brain around, look at it from the posterior side and see our four little bumps referred to as the corpora quadrigemini. Now we, when we slice through the midbrain, and here we have a transverse section of the midbrain, we're going to see all kinds of nuclei. So let's first orient ourselves. Notice that right here it says cerebral aqueduct. And so that's going to be pointing mostly posteriorly. So let's just put P here for posteriorly, which means that this is more anteriorly. And notice once again that even at the level of our brainstem, 
things are anatomically, bilaterally symmetrical. So as I said, there are various nuclei <clears throat> inside of our midbrain, and I'd like to call your attention to a nucleus that stains very, that I shouldn't say stain, that's, that appears very dark when we slice transversely through the midbrain. And we actually call it the substantia nigra, literally meaning the black substance. The reason for why it looks so dark is because it's filled with melanin. The neurons in this particular location, in this substantia nigra, produce dopamine. And dopamine can ultimately be converted into melanin, which is why we find melanin in this area. But the dopamine is also a very important inhibitory neurotransmitter. In other words, it plays an important role to inhibit the basal nuclei of the cerebrum. Remember that caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus, they need to be moderated by means of inhibitory um, signals such that our skeletal muscles will ultimately be controlled appropriately by those basal nuclei. So here you see the importance of inhibition in order for us to be able to have nice, smooth, voluntary contractions in our skeletal muscles. Well, what happens in people who suffer from Parkinson's disease is that these dopamine secreting neurons in the substantia nigra begin to die. And therefore, the substantia nigra has less and less and less inhibitory control over the nuclei located in the cerebrum. And consequently, this is going to lead to skeletal muscle activity that is not smooth and not controlled very well anymore. And this leads to the shaking in, that we see in the tremor that we typically see in people with Parkinson's. They often suffer from rigidity and can't, can't easily start to walk, for instance, or they're really slow in their movements. It takes a lot of focusing for them to even take a step if they even have the possibility or the ability to take uh, a first step. And some famous people that you probably know are Michael J. Fox, who suffer from this, and Muhammad Ali. So the important point for you to remember is that the source of the problem for Parkinson's disease is not in the basal nuclei of the cerebrum, but it's in the nuclei, particularly the substantia nigra of the midbrain in the brain stem. Now, it is true that at times the substantia nigra is considered part of the basal nuclei, but I'm going to distinguish between the cerebral basal nuclei and the nuclei of the midbrain, and the one that we're interested in here, that is the substantia nigra. Okay, that brings us then to the pons, and the pons is this bulging part. It still includes our um, cerebral aqueduct that is going to lead into our fourth ventricle. A little hard for you to read this blue, but um, right here, right? Right here is that fourth ventricle. Here's that cerebral aqueduct. And so the posterior aspect of that cerebral aqueduct is still part of the pons. So perhaps I should try to fill in the pons as follows. I'll use bright green like so. So all of this is pons and even a portion here. If we could cut through the pons, we would see that it's actually made up of an anterior portion that is mostly white matter. And the posterior portion is going to be um, more gray matter. So that sits more posterior to that cerebral aqueduct. The word pons literally means bridge, by the way. You might 
know the French word le pont, meaning bridge. It functions as a bridge between the lower brain centers and the spinal cord and the rest of the brain, even including the cerebellum. Remember that the cerebellum interconnected with the, um, with the midbrain via what we called the superior, so here is the midbrain, via the superior cerebellar peduncles. Well, we also have peduncles that interconnect the cerebellum with the pons, and we'll just call them the middle cerebellar peduncle. So I have listed that right here. We also see that the pons is going to give rise to <clears throat> three pairs of our 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And in the pons, we find very important uh, centers that regulate or help regulate our rhythm for breathing. So remember that breathing is controlled by the pons. We'll also see that the medulla plays a role, but there are at least two centers, that is collections of cell bodies that are present in the pons and play a very important role in our pace of breathing or in adjusting the pace and the depth of breathing I should be more accurate uh, in expressing that. Finally, you've heard me talk about the limbic system, which is the emotional system. Well, that is primarily associated with structures that arise from our forebrain. And what arises from our fore forebrain or the prosencephalon? That is the cerebrum and the diencephalon. Well, we're beyond those now. We're now looking at the brain stem and the brain stem is going to arise partially from the midbrain, right? And then the pons and the medulla oblongata, they arise from the hindbrain. And so in the hindbrain, we find a totally different functional system. So we do not find the limbic system uh, in these regions of the brain. Instead, we find the so-called reticular formation system. So when you hear brainstem and you were asked about what functional brain system is present there, it would be the reticular formation system. What does it do? We'll talk about that in another video that's coming up. So as I mentioned, the pons is called the pons for a region because it connects the higher brain centers with the spinal cord and it allows for um, communication between the rest of the brain and the cerebellum. It has important respiratory centers, but we even also find swallowing centers that you will study in AMP2, as well as bladder control centers, which are still not really well understood. It's still a difficult um, physiological process for researchers to understand how we control our bladder. And we find that the generation of dreams also seems to involve our pons. So this brings us to the last part or subpart of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata, which we see here in the purple. And as you recall, that's going to then continue into the spinal cord. Now, not only is this the most inferior part of the brainstem that's continuous with the spinal cord, but the medulla oblongata, together with the pons, helps form the, front, the, the, the anterior border of our fourth ventricle. You may need to go back to uh, the previous slide to see this better, but right about here is where that fourth ventricle sits, and then we have over here our cerebellum, right? Just like we saw in the pons, we have a bit of white matter and gray matter. As a matter of fact, the pons is going to start looking, I'm sorry, the medulla oblongata is going to start looking very much like the spinal cord. 
to where we have an inner core of gray matter and an outer layer of white matter only. All right. The rest of the brain, particularly I should say the cerebrum, even the cerebellum, they're going to have an inner core of gray matter in the cerebrum we talked about, a basal nuclei, remember? They were embedded inside of the white matter, and then all of that white matter was covered again by gray matter. Well, in the brainstem, particularly at the level of the medulla oblongata, we only see two layers, and that's an inner core of gray matter, and then that's surrounded by white matter. The white matter is going to be made up of the pyramids primarily. Remember that the pyramids cross over. They decussate at the level of the medulla oblongata, this being the medulla oblongata, and here is the pons. In the deeper gray matter, we find that there are various nuclei that are going to be involved with processing information from the cranial nerves, and we have these very characteristic, characteristic olive-shaped nuclei, and that's what they're called, the olive nuclei, particularly the inferior olive nuclei. They seem to play a role in cerebellar motor learning. So already you start to get a preview of the fact that the cerebellum seems to be involved with learning as well, including motor output. Finally, we have a third pair, or a third set, I should say, of cerebellar peduncles. So again, if this right here represents my cerebellum, we have three sets of peduncles. One pe set of peduncles connects the cerebellum to the midbrain. That's your superior set. Then we have the middle ones. And then we have the inferior ones that connect the cerebellum with the medulla oblongata. And once again, just to reiterate all this, we see a much larger picture of what I showed you a moment ago. We can clearly see those nuclei we call the inferior olive nuclei. You can see how the pyramids continue to descend and right here they're going to start crossing over to the other side as they enter into the spinal cord. Notice the arrangement of the spinal cord, this little letter H, very typical of the spinal cord. That is the, where we have the gray matter and the white matter surrounds it. If we were to cut right through the medulla oblongata, it would look similar with an inner core of gray matter surrounded by white matter. And of course, the pyramids are located in that white matter. And so here you can see the decussation of the pyramids and where did they start? They started all the way back here, or up here, I should say, in that primary motor cortex where they arise in this fan shape, which we call the corona radiata. The medulla, or the deeper portions of the medulla, contain nuclei again. And some of these nuclei are going to be similar to the ones we found in the pons. You might recall that the pons had two respiratory centers. Well, we again see two more respiratory centers in the medulla. In addition to that, in the medulla, we see centers that control our heart so, and also our blood vessels. So we refer to these as um, the cardiovascular control center or to... There's several centers together, all together. We refer to them as the cardiovascular control center. And then there's more centers that control vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing. Uh, a lot of these seem to be um, reflex types of um, actions that we don't have a whole lot of control over. Remember that it's really the hypothalamus that supervises a lot of these functions and therefore these control centers. The medulla and the pons are the, the little peons that have to carry out these commands. That's kind of how, how I think of it. Or maybe you can think of them as the managers while the hypothalamus is the big CEO, something along those lines. So this wraps up our discussion of the whole brainstem, and we're now ready to take a closer look at the cerebellum.